Oh, wonderful. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Huber. I'm a specialist with the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Uh, I apologize for, uh, for the delay, and I apologize for, uh, for only being available on audio. Um, had some difficulties with my computer, and uh, and ACS here was nice enough to patch me in over the phone. Um, so I'm I'm really glad that you're all here. I'm really glad that you're all interested in the in the Veterans History Project. Um, we are a uh, we're a 15 year old institution of uh, of the U.S. Congress. Um, we were created by unanimous decision back in the year 2000. Um, it all came about when. Uh, Congressman Ron Kind was having a barbecue in his backyard with his uncle, who was a World War II vet, and his uncle started telling war stories with his father. And they, and Congressman Kind just decided, wait a minute, this is this is too good. I got to go get a camera and record this because my kids might want to hear this. So he did, and the idea was born for a a larger scale project where people could submit their own stories, their family members' stories to be archived for in perpetuity and will be available for researchers and the general public and just anyone from future generations who might want to know what serving in the military was really like. Um, as I said, we were established in the year 2000. Uh, originally, we were supposed to be a five-year program, but it was so successful that we've been renewed every year and there's no reason to think that we're going to stop anytime soon or ever. Um, so far, we have about 97,000 oral histories and, uh, and artifact collections. Um, every year that grows, we probably get about three or 400 new collections every month, um, all from people like you who just go out into their communities and find veterans to interview and their families and their communities and film them and send them in. Um, I think the, the beauty of the project is, is its simplicity. Uh, because anyone can do it. All you need is a, a camera and a veteran and some time to sit down and talk. Uh, there are a few basic requirements that I'll get into in just a sec, but it's, you know, it's, it's really something that anyone can do and, and allows you to connect with your family and your community in a way that you might not have been able to before. So the, uh, the requirements that we do have, as I said, they're, they're fairly simple. Um, and hopefully, I emailed out a, uh, a copy of our field kit to everyone. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to follow along. It's, it's everything you need to know is in there, but uh, you know, obviously, it's helpful for, for someone to come in and explain in detail and, and answer any questions you might have. Um, so, if you are following along in the field kit, um, on page three, I'm sorry, on page. Ah, on page 13, we have uh, the VDN format standards. So that's, you know, before you start anything, you got to make sure that you're using the right tools. So we accept video and audio. Um, for video, we accept uh, mini DV, DV cam, or DV pro. We also accept, if you don't have uh, DV, you can record it on another medium and, and burn it to a DVD and send it to us. So we accept DVDs as well. Um, we accept audio cassettes, uh, you know, old fashioned cassette tapes, um, CDR audio and flash drives. Um, if you are putting it on a flash drive, uh, it's got to be in wave MPEG two, MPEG four and, uh, and I'm sorry. No, no more. <laughs> That's it. Those are the only formats that we accept on flash drives. Um, so there are different types of collections that we accept. Um, obviously, there's the video interview, there's the audio interview, but we also accept um, other uh, 2D materials as well. Um, we accept collections of photographs, we accept written memoirs, and uh, the requirements for those are, uh, are obviously a bit different from interviews. Um, interview requirement, basic interview has to be at least 30 minutes of length and in one of those acceptable formats. And that's it. That's the only requirement we have for, for audio and video interviews. Um, for photographs, we require uh, at least 20 original photographs, so no scans, no copies, um, at least 20 original photographs. And, uh, and for memoirs, they have to be at least 10 pages written, and they have to be unpublished. So, you know, if it's just 
know, your grandpa sat down and typed out 10 pages about what he did in World War II, great. If he, you know, is sending us a book that he has already had published, then, then unfortunately we're not able to accept that. Um, so that is what we call our 30, 20, 10 rule, 30 minutes for audio or video, 20 photographs or 10 pages of manuscript. Um, you can also um, kind of split the difference with them. So if you only have five photographs but would like to donate the, or would like to donate those, uh, you can give a 30 minute interview and then you can, you know, once you satisfied one of the requirements, you can donate any number of the other things. So, you know, you can do a 30 minute interview and donate five non-original photographs if you want. Uh, or you can donate 20 original photographs and do a 10 minute interview. As long as you satisfy one of those requirements, everything should be fine. Um, and since, um, I'm actually, Jesus, I'm not sure, is there a, like talk back capability on this? If people have questions, or am I able to hear them? Okay, excellent. So just let me know if, if anyone has, if anyone does have any questions, type them or ask them to Jesus, and uh, and I'm happy to, to pause and, and answer any questions anyone has. Okay, I just fell uh, off. So now is usually the time where I go about talking about how you find veterans to interview, um, but obviously you're all training for the uh, for the Camp Pendleton event. And yep. It's not Camp Pendleton anymore. Uh, well, just briefly because, you know, I'm trained to do this and I've got my standard spiel. I'll just briefly say, uh, oh, that's right. It's at the high school now. Um, I'm sorry. I apologize about that. Um, so usually, you know, veterans, administrations, hospitals, retirement homes and all that, but obviously you've got your, your event that you're going to and, and none of that matters. Um, so then we will skip straight on to the interview section uh, at the actual how-to. Uh, I'm sure all of you know how to use a camera or a video recorder. Um, um, usually fairly simple, set it up, point and shoot, press play. Um, the real technique comes in when uh, with the actual interview questions themselves. Uh, now on page two of our field kit, we do have a selection of suggested interview questions. Um, these are not required by any means. It's just a template to, to get you started uh, and to, to give you a, a you know a little push if you get stuck and can't think of anything to ask. Uh, but it does, you know, it, it follows a nice structure, uh, starting with their um, you know name, position in the military, where they came from, what their family life was like, um, what boot camp was like, where you got assigned, what you did while you were there what you did after you got back. You know, so it follows a nice little narrative arc if you just use the, uh, the suggested interview question. However, I will say that the best interview questions are not on here and they couldn't possibly be on here because the best interview question you can possibly ask is asking someone to elaborate something interesting that they just said. So I, it seems really obvious when I say it right now, but you'd be surprised how many people just don't think about it when they're sitting there actually interviewing someone, um, you know, you'll have someone, and this is an actual example that, uh, that we love to use because it's just such a missed opportunity. Um, they're just going down the list, asking the, the suggested questions. And when he's talking about what you did during, the, during their service, he says, oh, I was on a uh, uh, submarine in World War II that, uh, that got torpedoed. And you, know, you just, the interviewer, goes on and says, oh, and what did you do after you exited the service? And you know, obviously, you know, we want to hear about what happened when he got torpedoed. You know, so, uh, you know, don't just stick to the list. Ask follow-up questions. If you hear something interesting, you know, this doesn't have to be a, a stuffy interview. This is, this can be a dialogue. This can be a back and forth. This can be, you know, we want to know everything that happened. We want to know what their emotional state was like. We want to know how it made them feel, what it, how it affected them later in life. So, you know, the more detailed, the better, and the more follow-up questions you can ask, the better. You know, just be a good judge of what you think is, is something interesting and, and try and get them to expand on that. Um, but that being said, it's always important to respect the veteran's feelings. Um, if they start getting emotional, if they if you get to a topic that they don't want to talk about, you know, don't push it. You don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. You don't want them to, you know, you don't, 
a lot of veterans have had extremely traumatic events happen to them, and you don't want to make them relive that if they don't want to. Um, which is why it's always a good idea to have a uh, to have a comfortable setting, a comfortable chair for them, um, to have tissues on hand in case they do get emotional. And, and like I said, just always you know, be aware of their mental state and and just try not to put them in, in uncomfortable situations if you can. Um, some interview techniques that you can do, um, just some basic stuff. You know, this doesn't have to be history channel quality. This doesn't have to be documentary quality. As long as we can see the veteran's face as long, or if they're on video, or as long as we can hear them clearly if it's just audio, you know, that's, that's all that really matters. You know, it's about the content, not the style. Um, that being said, you know, you always, there are a few basic things you, you do want to watch out for when you're, when you're doing things. You know, try and have it in as quiet a uh, room as possible. Um, don't have the camera pointed directly towards a window because sometimes sunlight will come in and, and you can't see anything. Um, use the highest quality recording equipment that you possibly can. And uh, and just you know, other than that, though, you know, use your judgment. Try and make it as great as possible, but don't let don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Basically, you know, as long as you can understand what the veteran's saying, as long as you can see his face, as long as you, know, you can tell that this will be useful for for any researchers who who want to use this material, then you know that's good enough, and, and that's all we ask. Uh, we never reject things because of content. We never reject things because they weren't filmed well enough. You know, we only reject things if they don't meet our our length standards or our format standards. Or if uh, you know, unfortunately every once in a while we get someone who um, was in a branch that, that doesn't kind of doesn't count. Um, but that will uh, probably not be an issue for you guys. Um, so I do believe that I was talking with Ralph, and he said that, that you'll be interviewing some um, some Vietnamese soldiers as well. Um, unfortunately, as I told him, we can only accept U.S. service members, but what we can do is if there's a, a U.S. veteran that they were connected to, and maybe they served alongside them, if you get both the U.S. veteran and the Vietnamese veteran uh, or civilian interviews, we can attach the, the Vietnamese person to the U.S. veterans, so we can archive both of those. Um, or, of course, I'm sure there's you know, historical societies in your area that would that would love to have the Vietnamese side of the story as well. So, unless there are any questions about the interview questions and, and interview techniques, um, after, uh, go on to, to what you do after the interviews are done. Um, so, depending on the format that you're recording in, um, if you're recording in many DV tapes, uh, that's all you need to do. Just pop the tape out and send it to us. Um, if you're recording on some other format, then you're obviously going to need to put it onto a DVD or a flash drive. Um, once you've got that and uh, and you filled out the forms, which I'll go over in just a second, um, once you've done, got that and filled out all the forms, um, just mail it to us. We're at the uh, Veterans History Project, Library of Congress, 101 Independence Avenue Southeast, Washington, D.C., 20540 And uh, it's important to note that when you are sending the, uh, the interviews in to us, um, you need to use a commercial carrier, so FedEx, UPS, DHL. Um, the reason that we ask you not to use the U.S. Postal Service is because due to the anthrax scare uh, 10 or 15 years ago, all of our U.S. Postal Service mail that comes here gets irradiated for security purposes, and oftentimes that destroys the media that's sent to us. Um, so we do ask that you, you send us that extra UPS or, or some other commercial carrier. Um, use the cheapest service possible. It's still going it, to, it's not going to get irradiated, but it still does have to go through security screening, which will take at least a few days. And uh, so if you pay extra, we're it's kind of useless because we're not going to see it for a few days anyway. Um, so when you send it in, um, you're going to want to make sure that you've got all of the forms filled out correctly. Um, forms are all in our field kit um, from 
pages four to twelve. Um, I, I know it's a lot of forms. It's it's a pain to fill them out, but we're we're the government, and we wouldn't be the government if we didn't make you fill out a lot of forms. Um, and we do need all of those. Unfortunately, we we will kind of set back things if if they don't have all of the required forms attached. Um, first form is the cover letter. It's it's very easy, very straightforward. Date, name, organization, address. Um, just fill all those out. Um, veteran's name and materials enclosed. You know, very straightforward. Just follow the directions. You'll be fine. Same with the biographical data form. Um, everything is is just right there, spelled out for you. Um, fill that in. Just make sure to to hit all of the boxes and, and fill in all the lines. Uh, the veteran's release form. Um, obviously, you're going to need the veteran to sign that in person when they're doing the interview, unless you you know have their address and can follow up with them later. But obviously, it's always easier just to do it at the interview. Um, all that says is that um, that people will be able to to see the their collection and researchers will be able to use it and that they're okay with that. Uh, important thing to note about our collections is the veteran retains the copyright forever. Um, it's not our property. That's why we have this release form, because it is veteran's property. They own it. And before we use it for anything besides uh, you know, a researcher looking at it or the general public looking at it, you know, if we're going to use it in, in an ad, in a promotion of some sort, we always get the veteran's permission. So that's, that's why they retain the copyright, so they can decide if they want that sort of thing to be used. Um, Can so anybody hear me? Important to get. Obviously, we can't accept anything without that. And then the flip side of that is the interviewer's release form. Um, basically, same thing, um, except saying that I'm the interviewer and, and I consent to, to all that. Um, obviously, the interviewer doesn't retain the copyright, the veteran does. So they don't have as much say, or actually, probably really any say, if we're going to be using that in promotional materials or anything like that. Uh, that that all lies with the veteran. The next one is the audio and video recording log, and this is quite possibly one of the most important parts of the entire package. Um, this tells what format it is, and more importantly, it tells what is actually in the interview. Um, and the reason that this is incredibly important is because when we receive the uh, the interview and we archive it, every collection that we have that gets archived, it gets logged in our database. And what you're doing in, in this log is you're saying, okay, at minute one, veteran tells his name and, and what branch of service he's in. At minute five, he talks about his experiences in Bukki. At minute 10, he talks about being sent to, to Normandy in World War II. Uh, so you're explaining you know, exactly what's going on. It can be as detailed as you want it to be, um, and since it's so important, you know, we do ask that you be as detailed as possible. And the reason that we ask this is because when a researcher comes and wants to find something out, that this log is the only way that we know what's inside a collection. So if the researcher comes and says, I'm writing a book on, and this is another actual real life example, um, a researcher comes and says, we're writing a book on World War II veterans who went to work at IBM in New York after the war. Yes. That's a very good question. Um, it's possible that hmm. it is a very good. I have not encountered that before, unfortunately. Um, it is possible for you know the veteran to voluntarily give up their copyright if they want. Um, in that case, I believe it would be between the veteran and the university. Um, we don't require that the veteran keeps the copyright. We do that as a courtesy to them. 
Um, so if the veteran wants to give up the copyright to the university, then that's fine as long as the veteran's aware that that's what they're doing. Does that answer the question? Okay, wonderful. Um, so, let's see, where was I? Ah, yes, the, the log. So, we had a researcher come in and ask, uh, we, I need to do research on veterans from World War II who went to work for IBM in New York after the war. Um, you know, obviously, that's a very specific kind of tough order, but we searched the database and sure enough, we had about five veterans who had worked for IBM after the war. And the only reason we knew that is because someone in the log, instead of just saying, you know, 36 minutes, veteran ended World War II and went back to U.S. Instead of saying that, they said, you know, veteran ended World War II, went back to U.S., and worked for IBM in Buffalo, New York. Uh, so the more detailed you are, the, uh, the more useful it is to us and the more useful it is to researchers. Um, I know it takes a little bit of time, but, but we'd really appreciate it if you'd make those as detailed as possible. Um, otherwise, you know, no one's ever going to see the collection. I mean, that's what we're here for is, is to have the public and, uh, and researchers be able to have these. And if, and if it's so generic that nothing anyone needs ever comes up in a search when we search for the, the log, you know, unfortunately, no one's ever going to see these wonderful stories that you're all out there recording. Um, so the more detailed you are, the more visible it will be, the more helpful it will be to both researchers and us. And I'm sorry I took up so much time on this, it's, it, but it is a very important issue. Um, same thing with the photograph log, which is the next one. And obviously, if you don't have photographs or if you only have photographs and don't have video, you know, only you only have to fill out the appropriate one. So if you only have photographs, just fill out the photograph log. If you only have video, just fill out the, the video log. Uh, but as I said, same thing on the photograph log. Um, be as detailed as possible in the descriptions of the photographs because, once again, this is the only way that we can ever find anything is what's written down in the log. And other than that, um, the that show, oh, except for we do have another form for uh, for manuscripts for memoirs, and I'm guessing you're probably not going to get any of those. So I doubt that it would be helpful to go over that. Um, so that is the uh, the general overview. Um, everything that I've covered here should be all the stuff that you need to know to to do this. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to ask right now. Um, other than that, though, I, I think you all should be set to go off. And if anyone does need help, uh, you know, forget anything that, that they think might be important, I'm always available. Uh, my email is ahub at loc.gov, and my phone number is 202-707-1819. Uh, I'm available. Um, Eastern business hours on my phone and I'm available. Um, well, actually, since you're in California and, and the time difference is, is going to be make it. So I'm not always going to be in the office. You need me. I'm going to give you my, uh, my personal email, which is Andrew, A N D R E W H U B E R D C at gmail.com. As you can probably already see as I'm <laughs> logging on that in the Google app. But if you have a problem and, and you email me on that one, I'll, I'll see that 24 hours a day. Um, so did anyone have any other questions? No, unfortunately, we do not accept uh, many audio tapes. Um, if that's all you have, then, um, then the best thing to do would be to uh, probably upload that onto the computer and, and make it into a wave or a uh, yeah, actually, it would have to be a wave file. Okay, um, 
as far as I know, we count as public domain because we, you know, we are open and available to the public. Um, and, and we allow basically anyone to use that, you know, those materials. Um, so I don't think that would be a problem, but let me, uh, let me talk to my supervisor and just make absolutely sure on that. And I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, and good luck with all your interviews. You're welcome.